Good morning, and welcome to this, the third day of the Federalist Society's National Lawyers Convention. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. I'm very pleased to welcome you back today and wish you a happy Veterans Day. I express my personal heartfelt appreciation for all our veterans, and I ask you to join me now in a moment of silence. Thank you, and thank you to our veterans. In feedback on the convention thus far, the most frequently asked question concerns turnout. Just how many viewers do we have for each of our panels? The numbers are in for day one, and I'm pleased to report that attendance is robust. Day two numbers are still being counted, frankly, as taking a bit longer than I had hoped. In terms of results so far, though, while we'd be limited, to the Mayflower Hotel's big rooms of 300 to 400 people per panel and in the ballroom, perhaps 500 people for major addresses, we're averaging just over a thousand attendees per panel on day one. There could be some recounting and refinement of those numbers, but I'm pretty sure they're firm. Of course, there's no charge to attend this year's convention online, so please continue to publicize it to colleagues and friends. On our agenda later today, as we approach the midway point, of this year's convention. We'll get an update on labor and employment law from agency leaders. We'll also check in with thought leaders about the current state of intellectual property with some emphasis on uncertainty in the field and what that means for businesses and others. We'll close our discussion today with a look at law enforcement and some of the challenges faced in the perplexing modern era. But first, we host our opening panel on China brought to us by our National Security Law and International Law Practice Group, moderated by Judge Lisa Branch. Judge Branch sits on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals after having served on the Georgia Court of Appeals. She spent time clerking and in private practice, but she's also got experience in the executive branch within OMB at OIRA, and perhaps more relevant for our purposes today in the Department of Homeland Security. She's a regular at the Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention, and I'm so happy she agreed to participate again this year. Judge Branch. Uh, Dean, thank you. Um, hello to our virtual audience and to the panelists. And as Dean noted, today is Veterans Day, and we honor all those who serve this country. Um, I wanna welcome you to the first panel of the third day that, that Dean walked you through the agenda for the day. Um, of the Federal Society Annual Lawyers Convention, which is entitled The Law, China, and the Possible New Cold War. Our country's shifting relationship with China over the decades has always been the subject of much news coverage. And today we'll examine how the rule of law figures into those complex interactions. We all know that the United States has at its foundation the rule of law, and the same is true of some other Western nations. But what about China? It has a legislature and courts, but with its institutions under political supervision and control, it has no rule of law as we define it. How does China's approach to the rule of law affect its relationships with other countries around the world? How should China's lack of a rule of law as we understand it influence the United States approach to China? Our distinguished panel will address these themes during its discussion, and I will briefly introduce our three speakers in the order in which they will speak, but please note that they have much more detailed biographies that you'll find on the Federalist Society website. Each, panel will then, each panelist will then deliver brief remarks. I will then engage the panel in discussion before we turn to the audience for Q&A. And let me start with the introduction of the speakers. First up, we have Professor Julian Koo. He's the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and is the Faculty Director of International Programs. And he is the, um, the Dean Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law at Hofstra University School of Law. His primary research interest is the relationship of international law to constitutional law. And he's the co-author with John Yu of Taming Globalization, International Law, the U.S. Constitution, and the New World Order. Uh, Professor Ku will focus on what China is doing in the United States. 
Um, our second speaker will be Congressman Mike Rogers. He is a former member of Congress representing Michigan's 8th Congressional District, and he previously served as an officer in the U.S. Army and an FBI special agent. While he was in Congress, he chaired the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and he currently serves as the vice chairman of the board at the MITRE Corporation and is a senior fellow at Harvard University, as well as the chair at the Center uh, for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, where he directs the center's national security programs. Congressman Rogers will discuss China's efforts to gain influence around the world. And our third panelist will be Dr. Richard Haas. He is in his 18th year as president of the Council on Foreign Relations. From January 2001 to June of 2003, he was the director of policy planning for the Department of State and was a principal advisor to Secretary of State Colin Powell. He was confirmed by the Senate to hold the rank of ambassador, and he's also served as the U.S. coordinator for policy toward the future of Af Afghanistan and as U.S. envoy to the Northern Ireland peace process. And from 1989 to 1993, he was special assistant to President George H.W. Bush and senior director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council. And he will discuss uh, focus on Chinese foreign policy. I will now pass the mic to the first speaker and then the, uh, to Professor Ku, and he will then pass the mic to the next speaker in order. Professor Ku. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Judge Branch. And I want to thank the Federalist Society uh, for inviting me to uh, invite me back to speak at the National Lawyers Convention. Um, the last time I spoke on a panel at this convention, I believe was in November 2012, just after another presidential election where the Republican candidate, let's just say, didn't do as well as most members of the Federal Society had hoped. So uh, given this track record, I may not be back here for another eight years. So I really do hope I'll try to make this opportunity count. Um, so, you know, possible Cold War with China is a huge topic. Um, there are, you know, so many different angles to it. There's the possible armed conflicts that might occur in Taiwan or South China Sea. There's competition um, for global dominance in the high tech world. Uh, but I wanna focus my comments as Judge Branch mentioned on one aspect uh, of, the, of a potential cold war that I think deserves a lot more attention, especially for members of the Federal Society. And uh, for decades, China has been engaged in uh, sophisticated influence and espionage operations within the United States that are designed to advance China's economic and national security interests. Um, and this is a real problem that we need to counter in effective ways. And I think the Trump administration has really made a lot of progress in this front. But I wanna urge us uh, as we enter a new administration to rethink and improve this approach so we can push back in ways uh, that don't undermine our overall efforts to compete with China. So let me start by describing uh, what I mean by Chinese influence and in espionage operations. Um, Influence operations, I mean, uh, Chinese state-sponsored activities to influence U.S. public discourse um, and government policy in ways that benefits the Chinese government. And I, I'll just note the Chinese government is not the only foreign government to play this game, um, but it is the only one that's a real possible Cold War adversary. Now, there are two kinds of uh, Chinese influence operations that are particularly troubling. Um, the first kind involves uh, buying influence uh, in U.S. higher education through the establishment of institutes, research partnerships, or other sort of uh, funding from the Chinese government or indirect funding from private Chinese-based groups that are allied or directed by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, one example of this effort was the, is the establishment of Confucius Institutes for Chinese language training at around 65 to 75 U universities across the US and around the world. So this is a good example of an influence operation, you know, you, uh, because it's, it's essentially, it's, you know, it's just a way to learn Chinese. It's, a, it's an institute designed to help you learn Chinese. But uh, these institutes have also been accused of imposing a Chinese government censorship of controversial topics in the classroom. And here I think the institutes and the other sort of academic partnerships are, are, are troubling because it's not so much the explicit censorship, which I think a lot of universities have managed to push back on, 
But I think having going into partnership with Chinese government affiliated entities really has, a, has the effect of muting criticism of China on campus that might otherwise have occurred, um, certainly from university administrators, but also from faculty and students. So like one example, events with Chinese dissidents that might have been held or just not held because it's controversial. Uh, academic conferences and subjects critical of China are going to discourage behind the scenes. Um, because the, this is influence is subtle and largely unseen, I think this is the, one of the more pernicious ways in which we've seen uh, Chinese government influence in US society in ways that are um, not beneficial to us, I believe. Now, the second kind of Chinese influence operation is um, much worse, but less subtle. Um, this involves buying influence via prominent US political figures. So it's a traditional type of influence operation. Um, sometimes this occurs through legal means like hiring lobbyists in a way that's publicly disclosed and registered. Um, China doesn't really officially hire lobbyists, but uh, entities influential or affiliated with the party do. Um, or it might be illegal, such as the recent revelations just in September that former um, uh, GOP figure Elliot Brody lobbied the U.S. government on behalf of the Chinese interests to, among other things, extradite a Chinese dissident in the U.S. back to China. Um, he pleaded guilty recently to accepting money to lobby the administration on this issue without registering and disclosing that he's accepting that money. Um, so this is these are types of influence operations, and if they're if they're not really noticed, you might see the political discourse or the political system even adjust in ways that are not. Uh, transparent uh, to benefit China because of these sorts of influence operations. So at the same time the Chinese government has conducted these subtle influence operations, it's also succeeded in supporting both traditional and economic espionage, uh, traditional and economic espionage operations. Um, the past few years has revealed Chinese government has successfully recruited at least three CIA agents to, um, uh, to their cause as well as the State Department employee. Um, meanwhile, Chinese hackers, of course, penetrated the Office of Personal Management uh, for personal data on U.S. government employees. Um, what really makes Chinese espionage efforts unique, though, is how China has sought to penetrate not the U.S. government, not just the U.S. government, but also the U.S. private sector, seeking intellectual property and other valuable corporate trade secrets. Um, I think they've done this uh, not just over the past few years, dozens of cases have been filed against Chinese nationals who've been alleged to have appropriated trade secrets from US companies for their own personal benefits, but also sometimes to benefit Chinese government entities. Um, just one example, they've also convinced prominent US scientists, like the chair of Harvard's chemistry department, to share cutting edge research with the Bureau of Generous Research stipends, such as the professor at Harvard got a mere $50,000 a month, plus $160,000 a year, to uh, help him do research um, on, you know, share his research with them. And that's a, type of thing that could buy a little bit of influence. Um, okay, so the point is we don't know, the reason we know about these activities is not because of journalism or investigative reporting, but it's actually because of charges brought by the United States Justice Department. Um, in particular, under the Trump administration, the DOJ has really wielded the Economic Espionage Act with great effect. Um, also, the administration has started to use uh, federal disclosure laws to push back against Chinese influence operations really going after people for failing to register as a foreign lobbyist, failing to disclose um, that they received Chinese money, such as the Harvard chemistry professor. It even charged an NYPD police, uh, NYPD police officer here in Long Island uh, with spying on local Tibetans um, for the Chinese government. These are novel and innovative uses of existing laws that I think have had an impact on deterring and pushing back against Chinese espionage and influence operations inside the United States. But my main point here I want to uh, sort of focus on is while this has been good um, and uh, this the Trump administration deserves credit for really focusing on China's activities in the US and its use of existing laws to push back, I think there's a lot of room for improvement, not so much on the actual policies, um, which I fully support, but it's the messaging around these efforts that have been uh, disappointing and in some cases counterproductive. So there's been some public messaging from top U.S. government officials about China's threat in general, but there's not really been much explaining of how the U.S. is fighting back by deploying its resources within existing laws and institutions that protect even suspected Chinese spies with the full gamut of U.S. constitutional rights and due process. Indeed, to give one example, this past July, um, President 
uh, uh, Attorney General Barr gave a large, a long, important speech on China. But in this speech on China, he barely mentioned his own department's efforts in this regard. Uh, he didn't point out that China, his department's efforts to counter Chinese operations fully respects the rule of law and uses the U.S. justice system. He did not point out that the department has to gather evidence, let defendants challenge the evidence in open court. And he's not pushing back against China. He needs to explain that we're not pushing. He didn't bother to contrast the U.S. procedures and processes with the abhorrent Chinese practice, government practices that they've used in recent years, which just in many cases, completely ignore and disregard due process when they arrest both Chinese citizens, but also foreign citizens, U.S. citizens, by accusing them of subversion and threatening national security, and then just throwing them away, uh, throwing them in jail for six months without, without any chance to contest those charges. Um, so why does such messaging matter? Because we need to keep in mind that the Chinese government is perfectly capable of flipping U.S. counter espionage influence operation efforts uh, in a way to smear the U.S. government and the United States' image within China. Nearly all the targets of counter-China initiatives are either Chinese nationals or naturalized Chinese Americans. And it has already, and the efforts have already led to accusations by Asian American groups that the DOJ is conducting racially discriminatory operations. And the Chinese government has picked up on this um, and has been to paint the U.S. efforts as motivated by racial animus rather than any real concern for national security. And meanwhile, the Chinese government can point to U.S. politicians and leaders who regularly denounce our own institutions, including the Department of Justice and the FBI, as corrupt and political. Um, and in this regard, I think the uh, battle we've had over the past four years about what the DOJ is, its so-called corruption, the deep state, the FBI, has made it really difficult, I think, for the U.S. government to promote the benefits and what's really great about the U.S. justice system abroad. So it's easy for Chinese propagandists to take the words and tweets of our own leaders to paint all of the US efforts to counter Chinese operations in the United States as simply corrupt attempts to oppress and discriminate against Chinese people here um, and to really denigrate the image of the United States in the eyes of uh, Chinese people, including Chinese students living here in the United States. Um, and so while the image of China and the United States has gone way downhill the last few years, it's also worth noting that the image of the United States and China has also noticeably dived in recent years, especially among younger Chinese. We're going the wrong direction. Um, older Chinese have a more favorable view of, of the United States and, and China than younger ones do. And this is a terrible failure. Whatever the failings of our legal system, it's galling to me to read and listen to Chinese social media users dismiss the U.S. justice system as corrupt and racially biased simply by quoting our own politi political leaders and also activists in our society. And that's too bad, because I think one of the most important components of US power in its competition with China is the fairness and reliability of our legal and political institutions, which Judge Branch mentioned, the rule of law. And so I hope the next administration will remember to deploy this power against China. It will require all of us, it will require better messaging, but also require all of us to take a step back uh, while before we tear each other apart. Um, the more we tear each other apart at home, both metaphorically and literally, I think the harder it's gonna be for us to compete with China on the global stage and to win a future possible Cold War. So that's it for me. Thanks so much for listening to me. Now I turn it over to Congressman Rogers. Great, well, thank you, Professor. I, I appreciate that. Uh, thankfully, I got to my mute button early. Normally, I give the best part of my my uh, speeches are uh, on mute, never to be recovered again. But I think I got to figure it out this time. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Judge Branch. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And uh, Ambassador, thank you as well. And thank you for your service, uh, all of you. Uh, in the in in what is the greatest democracy on the face of the earth, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about what uh, some call the three pillars. The Chinese refer to it as the three uh, the three warfares, and why this is important because it has its components in the the uh, People's Liberation Army, but it's also really or uh, oriented from the Communist Party of China, and so they use all of the elements of government to try to pull this off. And so what they did in 2006, they did a comprehensive study, they being the PLA, uh, and ability to fight back was absolutely incompatible 
uh, with winning informationalized high-tech wars. So they just weren't keeping up on that front. Uh, and they decided, well, if we can't defend ourselves, so it got off an old playbook. The actual original language of these three warfares came in about 1963, uh, and they decided that they were going to re-engage in what they're again calling three pillars or three three uh, warfares. Uh, so what they were going to do is preempt in the minds of foreign policymakers. Uh, you know, to the professor's point, we call those information operations. Uh, and they were going to try to collapse organizations, meaning the trust in organizations. They were going to try to collapse them in the, in the host countries of which they're concerned. Uh, they're going to blunt uh, the determination uh, of those countries to do beyond uh, or what, what the Chinese might argue is aggressive behavior. Uh, and they did that by, again, dusting off these three warfares and then modernizing them. So it's now a module of what the PLA would perform uh, in activities around the world. And so they, those three, four, three warfares are uh, public opinion, both domestically, by the way, and internationally. So they have operations to do both. Psychological is the second. Uh, and think of uh, boycotts, uh, there was one specific that was interesting to me when they came out with their first anti-ship uh, uh, missile. They were noticing uh, in the Iraq and uh, Afghan war that Americans' tolerance for loss was significantly reduced. And so what they did is they deployed an anti-ship missile uh, in the Guangdong province. Uh, it had never been tested against a moving target. So there had been tests to see that it actually functions and get where it's supposed to go, but never against a moving target. So if you're in military circles, that would be a huge drawback to that missile system, and maybe you would plan accordingly. But they promoted it, the Chinese government promoted it and promoted its ability to take out carriers. Uh, and they reminded people, I think this is really interesting, that so if you take the, the Reagan Nimitz class aircraft carrier, about 5,000 people on board, uh, sometimes as many as six, cost $4.5 billion just to build it. That doesn't count any of the weapon systems that are on board. That would be, and if they could take out just one of our aircraft carriers like the Reagan, uh, that's more uh, than 15 years of deaths of US service members in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so they started playing on the, the psychological aspect of, hey, you know, you're going to go get into this mess. We've got bad news for you. You're going to lose 5,000 sailors in one swipe in one day with our new capability. There were still at the time uh, military analysts saying, I'm not sure the thing will even work the way they say it's going to work. However, it had an impact. The Navy actually had to change the way it was maneuvering in the region. Uh, they also use boycotts. They talk to the, the uh, Scandinavian countries about not buying. Cycle battlefield in different ways, try to get in the minds uh, of their enemies. And as Chairman Mao uh, would say, uh, to rally true friends against true enemies is our purpose. And that's what he was developing this, this uh, three warfare system. And that last one uh, is legal. And so they, if you have the great example of this is that not necessarily taking something to court and trying to prove it in a court of law of which we would all know and respect, uh, but they're trying to do the, the, the court of public opinion uh, on legal opinion. So they make the argument in, uh, in their nation courts, uh, in their national system, international court of uh, courts, that at least the influence of those courts uh, and the laws of war. And they use all of those old precedences and try to make a public case uh, about why uh, their, their policy is right and our policy would be wrong. The great example of that to me uh, was the U.S. Uh, Bowditch. So they were arguing, China was arguing that the, the U.S. ship Bowditch, uh, Navy ship Bowditch, was not uh, able to go into certain navigable waters because it was against international law, it was against the laws of war, it was against their uh, borders. And so they were making a legal public case uh, on why uh, that was true. And they focused primarily in the Pacific Rim, but they also used uh, Europe and other places. And they have spent lots of money to promote this psychological uh, 
public uh, uh, effort, law effort, through uh, Chinese uh, global TV, right? So it's not a part of the PLA, but it is a part of the Chinese Communist Party effort. Uh, and they have a hundred uh, different uh, uh, journalists at these stations broadcasting in five languages, and they are aggressive about it. Think about, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, VOA, Voice of America, uh, which we have gotten away from, I think, sadly enough. Uh, but they have used that model and multiplied it and now are having these conversations to try to sway people psycho with, with psychological efforts, with uh, public opinion efforts. And again, they're trying to make this public law case on why the United States is wrong. So China would be a victim uh, of what uh, countries like the United States uh, are doing. And so when you start taking all of that and then you look at uh, the way the military looks at it, and it's, it's a force multiplier, and then apply it to what you see happening today. South China Sea, they're using all three of those, the three warfares. You look at inf uh, information operations here in the United States, and we saw it a little bit, and the FBI came out and said, hey, guess what? China is in on the game. It's not just Russia. Uh, China's getting into this business of information operations, uh, trying to inf uh, convince Americans so and we should not like each other very much as Americans. And so those information operations, uh, by the way, they learned from what the Russians were doing. And that's exactly what the Russians were trying to do is create chaos and make us not believe in our institutions and make us believe that our neighbor who thinks a little differently than, I, than we do is now somehow an enemy of the United States and uh, we should hate each other and, and do horrible things. Uh, all of that was a Russian plan. We see the same kind of tactics with the Chinese and they're getting better. Um, you know, their, their cultural awareness of the United States is getting better. Their understanding of how you would craft messages to target Americans is getting better. Same in Europe, same in other places. So they are aggressively using those tactics uh, to try to circumvent what we would understand uh, is a, which would be a normal defensive buildup. And so if you recall, again, my other great example of this is they realized once they decide that they weren't going to uh, win these high tech wars, at least in 2006, they were going to make the investment, they were going to use these three warfares, uh, and then they were going to try to go after our Achilles heel, which was space. If you remember in 2007, I happened to be the chairman. That's just a note you don't want to get uh, when they walked in and said, guess what? They fired an anti-satellite uh, missile and hit their target. Um, and, and of course, a non-physicist, I was all thinking, wow, as an FBI guy, that's one heck of a good shot. Uh, but as a physicist told me, nope, that's just a math problem. You just you know, line it up and it's, it's gonna be in the right place and you fire. Uh, kind of took away, blew my steam a little bit about what good shot that was to take out one of their own uh, satellites. But the reason they did that again, and then they broadcast it, they wanted us to see it. Uh, they shot one of their own uh, uh, satellites out of the sky, by the way. Uh, was the fact that they wanted to convince the United States that our military grade GPS system wasn't as good uh, and we shouldn't uh, rely on this thing like we may have before. That's where they're going. You're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion today. Judge, uh, thank you. Professor, thanks. And Ambassador, you, sir, are up next. Well, thank you, Congressman. And it's a uh... It's an a rare opportunity and a pleasure to, to be on such a distinguished panel uh, speaking in front of this uh, audience. Uh, I was asked to speak about U.S.-Chinese relations and uncharacteristically, I will do what I was asked. Uh, just to give some historical context, we are now living in what you might call the fourth phase of the modern U.S.-China relationship. The first phase, which began during the Civil War when the United States and the Communist Party were on opposite sides of the Chinese Civil War, going through the Korean War. Here we are today, uh, marking Veterans Day. Well, uh, American and Chinese troops were, were in direct uh, contact with one another during the uh, Korean War. And this phase of essential hostility did not come to an end for till the end of the 1960s when the old adage, the enemy of your enemy can be your friend kicked in and when the United States and the People's Republic of China uh, both concluded that the threat posed by the Soviet Union was more uh, acute than any uh, bilateral difference they had. And what began then was a two decades long strategic reconciliation, uh, if you will, 
uh, ushered in by President Nixon and Henry Kissinger, where the United States and China found ways to manage their differences, finesse their differences, and uh, cooperate to a limited extent. This second phase of the relationship ended with the end of the Cold War, uh, when the Soviet Union disappeared, Cold War ended, and essentially the two countries had to come up with a, third, a new rationale for a third phase of the relationship. They did just that, and it was largely economic. And the whole idea was the two countries would become ever more integrated economically. China obviously saw it as essential for its growth, its development, maintained political stability. Americans were interested in access to this enormous market, but also there was the hope that by integrating China into the global economy, we could perhaps affect its own trajectory economically, politically, and in terms of its foreign policy. I would say this third phase came to an end over recent years. I can't give you a precise debate because it was, it was gradual, not a, not a switch, but essentially the economic relationship became as much a source of friction as it was cooperation. There was disillusionment uh, with uh, its impact on China. Clearly China was not becoming more open politically was not uh, playing the economic game, quote unquote, by the, uh, the, by, by the rules. And so in this country, there was greater skepticism uh, uh, of China and this relationship. And that's the phase we're in now. I think it's too soon to give it a, uh, a name, too soon to say exactly uh, what its characteristics are, but that's where we are. And it's clearly one defined by uh, considerably greater friction. I would say how this plays out has extraordinary consequences. This will be the defining relationship of this era of history. Uh, the US-Soviet relationship was obviously the defining bilateral relationship for four decades of the Cold War. I would think for the next few decades of the 21st century, the US-Chinese relationship will have enormous uh, uh, consequences, not just for the two countries, but really for the, the Asia Pacific region and indeed for the world, the world more, more broadly. What does China want in all this? Uh, obviously, I think uh, the party and the leadership is most concerned with their continued uh, role in the country. Uh, they want China's continued uh, rise uh, economically. And the two are seen as connected that China needs to continue to grow economically at a healthy clip in order for the party to continue to uh, derive uh, legitimacy. China wants its internal stability. It, it wants control also over what it considers to be, uh, if you will, greater China. Hong Kong, uh, obviously, uh, Taiwan and contested border areas, islands and so forth uh, with many of its uh, neighbors. I think that is the principal preoccupation of, of Chinese policy. Well, what about ourselves? What should, what should we, the United States, uh, want? I would say, more than anything else, our goal should be to influence how China uh, uses its growing power. I think China will continue to grow economically, it'll continue to get stronger militarily. Uh, to me, the, the challenge for American foreign policy is to influence China how, how China influence how China uses this, this greater capacity that, that they are uh, developing. As an aside, I do not think it is realistic for us to stop China's rise. I also do not think, and here I disagree with the Secretary of State as recently as his comments yesterday, I do not believe the United States can essentially take on the role of the Communist Party and try to bring about political transformation in China or regime change. I think that is simply beyond the, the reach of the United States uh, or traditional foreign policy, much as we essentially uh, have come to the same conclusion with many other countries. Also, I would argue, if possible, we want to avoid direct conflict uh, with uh, China. And I'd say overall, what we're, the, the challenge for the United States is how do we push back where Chinese behavior gives us real grounds for concern, whether it's approach to human rights, whether it's its economic behavior, intellectual property theft, its assertiveness in the South China Sea, its threats to Taiwan, what it's doing vis-a-vis -vis India and so forth. How do we push back in all these areas? At the same time, we try to avoid direct confrontation or, or, or conflict. And at the same time, one other goal would be how do we try to still carve out or protect at least the possibility of limited cooperation where it is on in, in our interest, for example, in curbing North Korean missile 
and uh, nuclear capabilities. If there's any country in a position to do that, it's China, since the preponderance of North Korean trade transits uh, China. How do we, for example, get China to cooperate on strengthening global health machinery, as we're seeing painfully when China does not cooperate or meet its obligations under global health regulations, we all potentially pay a, a price. How do we get China to change its trajectory on energy use? So climate change uh, does not suffer uh, even more of an effect from what China is doing. So I think that it's a, it's a complicated challenge for, for foreign policy to push back where we have to, yet to do so in a way that hopefully doesn't preclude limited cooperation. And none of this is gonna be easy, given that the contemporary China, Xi Jinping's China is different. It is qualitatively different, say, than Deng Xiaoping's China. This is a much more repressive China. It is more statist economically. Hope that the state role in the economy would be reduced. To, uh, those hopes have not been borne out. And obviously, this is a much more assertive China. It has greater military capability, uh, is much more willing to be active uh, in the South China Sea, vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors, and in the world with the, <coughs> excuse me, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So how should we go back, go about this foreign policy challenge? Uh, I would say first and foremost, we should do it with allies. It's the great structural advantage of American foreign policy. It's Japan, South Korea, all the countries, many of the countries in Europe, partners like India, countries like Vietnam. Unlike China, the United States has dozens of uh, willing potential partners to push back against China in one or more domains, be they functional, or, 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 or geographic. I think also there's ways we have to compete with China, for example, in the amount of funds and how we spend them on, on basic, uh, on basic uh, research. We have to internationally be more competitive with the Belt and Road Initiative. Again, it doesn't have to be symmetrical. We have uh, all sorts of tools that are available to us besides aid, things like uh, trade policy. And then I also think uh, we have to compete with China by the power of uh, our ex example. We have to live up to our own, own rule of law. If we're gonna be critical of China for what it's doing in Hong Kong, I would argue that American democracy has to be robust in every way. And I also think we need to be competent in everything we do. Uh, our own approach, say, to COVID, I think is uh, clearly, uh, from my point of view, been uh, largely a failure. And in some ways, the comparisons with China allowed Xi Jinping and the Chinese off the hook. We need to show, I believe, that democracy and the American economy, the American political system are capable, and that will get people in China to raise questions about the performance of their own system and their own uh, leadership. So there is a competition, and in some ways we compete by what we do, but in some ways we, we compete by what we are. So why don't I leave it at that and judge, uh, or your honor, uh, back to you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, those were thought provoking remarks and I'm hoping that uh, the audience is going to have a lot of questions and, and I would advise the audience if you would start thinking about what those questions want, might be. I do have a few questions for the panel. So I'm gonna uh, ask those questions first, but then I'll be kicking it over to the audience shortly. Um, uh, let me start with Congressman Rogers. Um, how, in China, the Chinese Communist Party um, has, it, it, the, the companies over there are state owned or state affiliated. So how has the Chinese Communist Party used or perhaps even abused the rule of law um, to support the efforts of these companies? Yeah, great question, Your Honor. Thank you. So one of the things that has troubled many of us, uh, matter of fact, my uh, my partner in uh, at the Intelligence Committee, uh, Dutch Ruppersberger from Maryland, we launched the first investigation into Huawei and ZTE in about 2011, just to try to get some sense. Could we pull all the intelligence together? What were, were they an arm of the Chinese Communist Party? Were they something different? Were they separate? Because we were getting all of this uh, information that they, in fact, were an arm of the state. And absolutely what we found out in that report in 2011 is the Communist Party of China decided that these companies needed to win. And what we saw them do is uh, uh, encourage uh, and reward intellectual property theft, meaning if you can't, if you can't beat them, steal it. Uh, and then repurpose it. We saw all of those activities. As a matter of fact, there's an FBI uh, 
uh, indictment out of New York that really details a lot of what uh, Huawei was doing, including reward. These points where uh, Western companies or or uh, even uh, you know trusted vendors and of our Asian partners couldn't compete. I mean, there were there's uh, deals where they would lay on the table that it will come in, we'll build out your network, we'll supply all the engineers. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to pay for ten years. No uh, independent. Uh, company can compete with that. There's no way you wouldn't have any cash flow for 10 years to do the deal. And why? Because the Chinese Communist Party decided that data dominance in 2025, which is their stated end game, was more important uh, than the profitability of these kinds of companies. So we have seen it across the board. They have different sectors of which the uh, the Chinese government will lay out and say, we need to lead in these areas and we will lead. Uh, so go out and do it. Uh, and then, you know, they're getting better at innovation. Uh, I don't still don't believe they're where we are, but through the taking of all that information and collecting that information and then uh, from, and, uh, from using government resources and applying it to companies, it makes a horrifically unfair advantage. So I think it's A, illegal, B, it certainly doesn't meet the to push back. I would love to be just a competitor economically with China because I think we could do well, but we're not even close to that. And before I move on to another question, I certainly did direct that at Congressman Rogers. Do any of the other panelists have any comments on that? Just quickly on Huawei, I just want to point out that um, I think it's another example of the theme I was trying to make, which is that we've given Huawei, um, we've, it's gone, the whole procedure against Huawei has gone through these rigorous uh, legal processes. And uh, to the extent Huawei has been prosecuted, it's hired the best lawyers. <laughs> It's a, and has really defended itself and has been able to push back. But I think it's a fair way to treat it in a way that China, U.S. companies in China don't get that kind of fair treatment. And so it's the type of thing we should be emphasizing, that we treat Huawei for all the problems, we treat them much better in many ways and much more fair uh, in the United States than U.S. companies would typically get within China. And that should be something we should emphasize. Uh, Professor, let me uh, stay with you for a second um, and, and certainly then open this question up to the rest of the panel. But we have U.S. businesses who are still doing business and uh, to a large extent in China. Um, will U.S. businesses be able to criticize the Chinese government and, and how, can, how can we protect them from any punishment that they might face in the Chinese market? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, and I, I, um, I think that Look, uh, it's in the U.S. interest for U.S. businesses to <laughs> succeed and to make more money. This benefits the United States people as a whole. Um, at the same time, I think, um, you know, they, uh, once the deeper you get within China and the more dependent you are in China, the harder it is it's going to be able to push back against China. So a great example of this would be how can you criticize the Chinese government's horrific treatment of its uh, Uyghur Muslim minorities um, when you have like the MBA, $100 million at stake, right? I mean, it's easy to say you should just condemn them, but you have $100 million at stake. So one thing I think we can do is the U.S. government can be helpful in first in making sure that uh, uh, one, that the U.S. company, restrict U.S. companies from doing bad things. And so give them the excuse by saying U.S. government won't allow us to do this. So you can't do business in Xinjiang. You can't do business with people who conduct forced labor. And then if the Chinese government complains, the U.S. companies say, look, what can we do? The U.S. government is making us do that. In other words, it gives them a shield to, uh, to say, well, it's not us, it's U.S. government. And I think that uh, can be helpful. We also have the, um, the anti-boycott laws that we have. So instance, you can't participate in a boycott of, the, uh, uh, of Israel without violating U.S. law. And I think those types of laws can be helpful in um, trying to pressure U.S. companies not to participate in any boycotts the Chinese government forces them into. In other words, if they ever want them to boycott uh, Hong Kong or boycott certain people um, in favor in order to benefit China. I think we can at least give signal to U.S. companies in the United States that that's going to be uh, U.S. government will push back against that. Having said that, in the big run, big picture, it's going to be hard because I think when you have a lot of money at stake, it's it's hard to balance those concerns. Um, and you want you don't want to offend, you know, a billion dollar, a hundred billion dollar market. Any of the other panelists have any comments on that? Um, let me ask one more question uh, to open up to the panel, and uh, then I'll start the Q&A. 
Um, we've talked about China and the U.S. And, and its relationship. What about China exporting its version of authoritarian capitalism to other countries? What are the implications for the rule of law and how should the United States deal with that export? Well, China, why don't I start there? China is clearly trying to do that to some extent. Uh, if you look at its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, it, it's doing a version of that in, in many countries, in some cases through some of the technology it is, it is making uh, available. Look, I think the best thing we can do there is compete in two ways. One is we have got to be on the field. And for a lot of countries uh, in Africa in, in particular, but also in Latin America, the Middle East, we've got to give them, uh, or South Asia as well, we've got to give them a choice. We've got to give them uh, alternatives. And we don't have to do it exactly the same way as China. I used the word before, asymmetrical. China is largely doing with large state loans. We have lots of other tools uh, at our uh, disposal. It could be inviting certain students from around the world to come here. It could be various types of trade uh, arrangements, investments, sharing of certain select uh, technologies. We can do just fine in competing with China in, in the field. And then second of all, uh, and it echoes something I alluded to, there is a degree of competition between China's authoritarian model and our democratic, more market-oriented uh, model. It's interesting when things recently, when we had violence in the streets here and so forth in recent months, China would show those images on state television and it would basically use it as a defense or rationale of their very controlled society. And I think the best way to compete with that sort of a message is to show that our more open society is able to peacefully address its, its shortcomings to show that we can be economically productive to essentially live up to our, our principles and values. And if we do that, that's the best way I know in some ways to pressure China. It's by the power and appeal of our performance, the power and appeal of our, of our example. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel? No, I'll just jump in quick. I, I agree with the ambassador. I will say one interesting thing on this, the data dominance piece, because it relates to this and why the uproar over TikTok. It's because all of that data from your geolocation to your purchase habits, to your viewing habits, to your friends, all of that data feeds in uh, through Beijing. And why is that important? If you want to know why they're winning the AI war, you hear you know people come out and say the artificial intelligence algorithms or China are better. Well, they're not necessarily better, but imagine if I have a 900 million base data set and I have maybe a thousand points of data on each one of those 900 million, my algorithm gets smarter as it goes. That's what this a whole argument about why we should not allow China to control this data. And what do they do with it internally that they'd like the Communist Party of China assigns a score, and what they did last year, they, they rejected millions of Chinese ability to buy a bus ticket or a plane ticket or a train ticket inside of China, not external, inside, because they didn't score well enough, according to the government uh, of China. That, uh, that's Orwellian. It's happening now. It's not 10 years from now. That ought to give the hair on the back of the neck of everybody watching this program. We just don't talk about it enough. And so they are trying to export that. So imagine Mike Rogers has a, a new business. I want to do business in China, which I agree uh, with the professor. We should try to encourage American style business with American values and and they said, well, you know, you were at the Federalist Society, uh, the National Lawyers Convention, and said, uh, you, you know, you said some things that made us mad. Guess what? You don't get a contract in China, even with it's a, a private company. And so that is what they're trying to export. It is a soft author authoritarian uh, approach that I do think we're going to have to pay attention. I think there's lots of ways we can push back, but and I agree with the ambassador on that. There's a whole s series of things we would need to do, but absolutely they're doing it, and they're not doing it directly necessarily. They're doing it in this kind of soft way of pushing out their ideas and beliefs by controlling people's data and information. Thank you. Uh, all right, we're going to start the audience Q&A part, and before we get into that, uh, the moment that everybody has been waiting for, the CLE password. 
And uh, just a reminder to the audience that we're only taking questions from those who are uh, watching this panel from a Zoom platform, not any of the other platforms. And at this point, uh, if you have a question and you're here uh, through Zoom video, please use the raise hand button on the lower middle screen. And if you're a phone participant, uh, you should dial star nine. All right, uh, we have a question from John Goose. Uh, please make sure to unmute your line. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. I don't have a question. I, I didn't think I pushed any buttons either, sorry. Okay, uh, moving on to Christopher Melling. Do you have a question? Yes, uh, this is Christopher Melling, BYU Law. Um, maybe I'm being unfair, but we've, we've talked about some of China's specific actions through the Confucius Institute, uh, educational system, other activities. I just, are we seeing a case where Americans are being complicit, um, willfully ignorant, maybe just not seeing China's competitor? I mean, what, um, I would love to hear your perspective, like what is the general uh, conventional wisdom? I mean, is it the fact that a lot of people just don't view China as a threat and, you know, see what they're doing and uh, why they're doing these things? If you could just, I would love to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Um, can I start with that? Or? Uh, yeah, I think that just a quick thought on this one, which is that I think it's mixed, right? The, the, I think the last four years, we have seen a really dramatic shift in US public opinion about China. It's been really dramatic. But up until then, I think, look, we are interrelated with China. And like, you know, we have 300,000 Chinese students in US universities every year more. We have incredible trade and travel and cultural links and family, like my own family. Like there's a lot of links. And so I think we don't see China historically in the same way, but I think that's changing. I think what's changing is really viewing China as a threat. And that, that's been a shift among the elites and it's starting to trickle down to uh, individuals. And I think this has occurred in part because of the Trump administration policies, which has really called out China and made it more public. And pr pr Professor Ku, did you have a question for the co-panelists before I go back to the Yeah, I, I know Ambassador House, wanted, did you want to address what I just said or? Uh, no, go ahead. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll. okay. I just, I, I did have a question uh, I didn't want to, um, this is actually for both for, uh, Ambassador Haas and um, Congressman Rogers, which is, here's a good example of how we might go forward. There's a bill in Congress, a resolution seeking to declare China as committing genocide in its Northwest province of Xinjiang um, because of its treatment of the Uyghurs. Um, now as a legal matter, this is a little tricky because uh, cultural genocide is a little bit harder to find. Uh, essentially there are, they're trying to make people give up their beliefs, give up their culture, give up their language, which is really, really bad, imprisoning them and forcing them to do so. Um, but Ambassador House, I was curious, is that the type of thing where if a unilateral declaration by the United States would do more harm than good? Or what if the US government started prosecuting Chinese people who are involved in the genocide, which we do have that possibility under our laws. In fact, we'd be required to do so um, if they came within US jurisdiction. Or is it something that we should try to build allies support for before making such a uh, determination because at the one time turning a blind eye to it and doing the Olympics and doing all good stuff with them is, is one thing, but then, you know, it, it's a possible serious genocide. How do we, how do we approach that going forward? Look, you, you raise a good question. There's, there's two things of late. One is what you're talking about, what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghur minority. The other is Hong Kong. China entered into international ob legal obligations in the handover agreement from the United Kingdom, and they've essentially violated them. One country, two systems is now one country, one system. And uh, so we, we've now seen two areas. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Virtually everybody else uh, in the Zoom meeting is a uh, lawyer, but we've had two areas where China has contravened either its own obligations that it took on or international obligations. I think the question with genocide is a, is a tactical one. Uh, one is the question of if we were to try to get multilateral support, uh, how much could we get? We wouldn't want to turn it into a debate between ourselves and others. The second of all, if we were to do it, what things would go into gear? What would it require us to do? What would it preclude us to, uh, from doing? So to me, uh, maybe I'm overly practical here, to me is, is less a judgment than what China is doing. And by the way, we don't need a formal declaration of genocide. 
to be strongly critical of what China is doing and all sorts of uh, fora uh, that deal with uh, human rights and the rest. To me, it's really a pragmatic question. If we were to go in the direction of a, a formal declaration, would on balance it serve the ends of American foreign policy? Would on balance it do anything to change Chinese behavior vis-a-vis uh, these people who are being treated so harshly and, uh, and unfairly? And to be perfect honest, I don't know enough about the, the actual consequences of going down that path, but I, get, but I think you raise a big point. I'd only want to go down it if I were persuaded that it wouldn't be, it couldn't be packaged as a US-China issue, but instead uh, much more the world against uh, the world against China. And I just have one other thing, it's been a little bit disappointing about how much of the Muslim world has not been willing to pre- push back against China. And this shows to me uh, how China has insulated itself through Belt and Road, through a lot of its economic uh, initiatives. A lot of the world is, is quite honestly, it's not that it simply doesn't want to choose between us and China, but often it's, 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 it's quite reluctant to take China on. Yeah, uh, uh, Professor, I, I, I agree with the ambassador. I would not support a genocide. Once you start cheapening what genocide means, I think it causes more difficulties down the road to actually target real genocide. I do think this has to be a co- an international coalition. And I would start with our Middle East partners, the Arab League specifically, uh, to do this. And, and what we have seen China do is that they will use economic extortion to get people not to talk about these things. Uh, and I think that's what uh, the ambassador was referring to. We've seen it. We've seen it with their 5G build out. We've seen it with uh, uh, other matters when uh, Canada talked about some human rights problems in China. Uh, China threatened that they wouldn't buy any more lumber for so many months. I mean, so they are really aggressive on this. I just think we have to be aggressive back. But genocide to me, boy, I, I just, I again, I just, I just hope we don't cheapen the term. It is horrific what happens in a, in a true genocide. Uh, I just don't think this rises to that standard. We ought to protect that for those issues. All right, let me turn back to the audience. And in, in the interest of full disclosure, this, uh, this person in the audience is a friend of mine. Uh, Irene Munn, please mute your line. Unmute your line, sorry. Irene? You're still um, muted. There go. Yeah, I think I've unmuted. Sorry, it took me a moment. Um, yes, my question is, is China, China's rise inevitable as well as who are our best allies around the world as it relates to this conversation? Why don't I maybe start and then uh, invite others? Is China's rise inevitable? It's a great question. Uh, in my experience, nothing is inevitable in the, in the course of history. China has had extraordinary uh, three, four decades of economic growth, but that growth is already slowing. It's temporarily somewhat higher now coming out of the COVID recession, but that won't be sustainable. So I think you're, you're seeing a slowing down. And one question is, as China slows down economically, what are the implications of that for political stability uh, within China? China also faces all sorts of challenges. One is demographic. The delayed effects of the one-child policy will be quite extraordinary. China uh, is going to get much older. Uh, its, po- its population will ultimately begin to shrink. And the ratio of working age to non-working age will move in, in directions that will not be good for the uh, society. China's had massive environmental degradation. And one consequence of that is a massive public health problem. Uh, China has a very concentrated politics. The fact that Xi Jinping has abolished term limits uh, and has done his uh, anti-corruption drive, he has consolidated power in his hands tremendously, which is both a source of strength, but also a weakness, uh, particularly if things begin to go off the rails. So I I can't sit here and and and, uh, again, I'm not going to say I'm a, a China expert, I'm a generalist who knows something about China. But if you read the China experts, there's a wide range of views. Uh, about what China's uh, future is 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 going to be, uh, I don't assume. I don't assume a lot, and I would just simply say you'd have. It's hard to imagine though that it, its its future unfolds without some major speed bumps, and I think they nearly had one when COVID broke out, and I think uh, they they've they've managed their way through it. 
but that was a potentially a real challenge to the uh, stability of, of China. But they, I think they have largely worked their way uh, through it. In terms of allies, I think it's different partners for different purposes. But obviously, uh, the Asian allies from Japan, uh, South Korea are central. You've got partners like India, to some extent, uh, Vietnam, Australia is an ally here. I think the European countries could be real allies in the technology realm. I think they could be real allies and partners in, in, in criticizing China on human rights. I think they could be real allies and partners in criticizing China for its growing dependence upon coal uh, as a source of uh, energy. So I actually think if, if we go about it, and among other things, I would love for the United States to reconsider its decision not to join what was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is a group that represents, uh, if we were to join it, 40, 45% of the world economy. And if we were to be in it, this would be a great way to con con confront China. Basically, you want to export to half the world. Here are the standards you have to meet. Here's what you have to do in terms of respecting intellectual property. Here's maybe what you have to do about human rights. Here's what you have to do about climate. So what we ought to be doing is looking for ways where we can pool our leverage against China. And that ought to be one of the things we look at really closely. Anyone else on the panel want to respond? I, I, I like the, uh, per, the uh, ambassador's amb uh, uh, optimism. I, I, what is not is are they going to be uh, I'm going to give you a great example the Department of Defense yesterday was saying that by 2035 90% of all uh, communications uh, uh, telecom equipment and we're, they're talking chips and boards and motherboards and FPGAs 90% by 2035 on its current trajectory will be built in China Remember what I talked about controlling data. If I can control what's in your phone and your computer, I'm likely to have a better understanding how I access it and get the things I need. So it, my argument is, yep, they're going to be on the rise. They're going to be a major manufacturing player for, for at least the foreseeable future. Uh, how do we build back uh, the ability? And I was a TPP supporter for that reason. I thought it was the one quickest, best way we could start to leverage up against China. So, yep, they're going to rise. They're, they're Listen to their white papers on their military dominance. They'll tell you exactly what they want to do, when they want to do it. Uh, and they've met every deadline. So from 20 to 2020 to 2040, they want to start pushing the U.S. out of the dominant player in the Navy uh, in the South, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and so I mean, those, that's pretty tall order. Well, they're on their way to do that with the technology they invested in. So they're moving out that way. Uh, and my argument is we better just step up our game. So, yep, they're going to be big players. I would love to be selling American products in China in 10 years uh, on an equal competitive environment. That's not going to happen by itself. And so we've got a lot of work to do uh, to get there. But we also need to understand we're going to be dealing with them as near peers, uh, both in nuclear and nuclear. Can I just piggyback on one thing the congressman said, uh, which is this to me is an argument for close relations between the United States and Taiwan, given how important Taiwan is in the global uh, chip production market. And also we have got to think, not, and by we, I mean the United States, our European economic partners together, we represent nearly half the world's economy. Some of our partners in Asia, like Japan, uh, we've got to think about supply chain resiliency. And we have got to have a very focused conversation about uh, and what items, what technologies are we not prepared to share with China? What items, what technologies do we not want to be dependent on China? And where we decide not to be dependent on China for certain technologies. And so if the question is, how do we build reliable arrangements among ourselves? What kind of stockpiles do we create here at home? What kind of national production do we mandate? That is the sort of conversation we need to have. And by the way, I am optimistic on that. I actually think, Congressman, maybe you know much better than I do, Mike, but I would think that might be an area of potentially bipartisan support. I, I could see on the Hill, people in both parties coming together to think really strategically about just this question, about what is what does our resilience require in a way so we reduce our dependence on China in a way that also, though, makes not just strategic, but also economic sense. And before we go to another audience question, Professor, do you have any comment you want to give on this topic? 
Uh, let's turn uh, to back to the audience. Uh, Seth Cohen, please unmute your line. Hi, um, my, uh, my name is Seth Cohen. Uh, next year, I'm going to be clerking for Judge Branch. Um, so my question is about uh, the extent to which this stuff can be accomplished um, or at least furthered through market reforms. Uh, so one of the big stories of the Cold War, right, was cropping up uh, liberalization efforts throughout the world through, you know, economic policy. Um, today, one of the things that we're seeing really emerge in American financial markets and, you know, put, putting aside the, you know, the difficulties um, with this sort of movement is ESG. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, to what extent you, uh, you all think that increased calls uh, on American companies doing business in or with uh, in China or with Chinese companies can help uh, sort of exert some of the pressures that you're talking about already, like, you know, establishing alternative supply chain. Well, I'll take a stab at this. And Seth, um, I've, the uh, the judge said, if the question didn't go well, I got news for you. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Come on. Got to have some fun on this thing. Um, the uh, I'll take a question of this because we ran into this a little bit. Uh, because of some of the uh, pushing back on, on privacy uh, uh, proposals across Europe. And so what they found is some of those privacy proposals were so completely 180 degrees inconsistent with the way the Chinese companies were expected to act. As a matter of fact, there's a, a national security law in China that says any company that's a Chinese company operating anywhere in the world, all of its data, uh, they don't have to have a, a, a court order. They don't have to have a, a subpoena. They, if the intelligence services show up and say, give us the data uh, on all of those people, they have to do it. So I do think that the ESG conversation is going to become more relevant in companies doing business there. Uh, as people understand where China is uh, on their ESG level, I would argue, listen, this is no more a developing country this is a sophisticated country that is lifted out, by the way, 650 million people out of poverty using some kind of a, you know, their modified view of capitalism, authoritarian capitalism. That part's probably good. Now people are exposed to that. Now it's our opportunity as consumers to start understanding, hey, if we're living by ESG standards, so should they. And so I think you're going to see more of that. It's just going to take a little bit. But remember, they carry a big stick and economic, they do not like people telling them what they're doing. Uh, and so extortion, I think, is the one challenge we have. And we've seen it in every policy issue, actually, we've talked about today, where you bump into that economic extortion to say, whoop, the Uyghurs? No, nope, you can't talk about that. That's, uh, that's a Chinese problem. We'll handle it. And so I think we're going to run into more of that and more uh, consumer awareness. And then I think we actually start making a dent on that ESG question in China. Do any of the other panelists want to respond? I would just say that uh, besides human rights, I would think the other area where ESG could come to target China a bit would be the environment and climate issues. Uh, cl China's climate trajectory, if one looks at the, the plans that have recently been released are really worrisome. Uh, both the, given the, it's not the scale of the growth so much as the, as the approach to energy and a, a really large coal component. And I would just think that, no pun intended, that climate concerns fuel are one, one of the powerful fuels of ESG. And I would think that would be a, a potential uh, concern in addition to what's going on in Hong Kong and the, and the Uyghurs. So I, I would not be surprised, actually, I'd put it the other way, I would be surprised if we did not begin to see these concerns pop up a little bit more into shareholder or stakeholder uh, conversations. Professor? Let me turn back to the audience. Uh, Carl Helmar, if you would unmute your line, please. I'm Carl? A brand new attorney. Uh, can you hear me, Judge? Yes. Uh, my name is Carl Peterson. I'm a brand new attorney and I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer. I served in China from 2014 to 2017. Uh, my question is regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. It's China's premier international relations program and it's largely building infrastructure across Africa and Central Asia. Do the panelists think that the United States 
and other nations can counter the BRI through creating and bolstering good governance in Africa and Central Asia through innovative solutions like charter cities. Well, this gives me 30 seconds to uh, talk about something we're doing at the Council on Foreign Relations. Our next task force report, it's a commission, uh, is on how the United, how we should understand the Belt and Road Com Initiative and how the United States ought to counter it. And uh, I take it seriously in terms of what China is doing with its economic reach, but using it both to promote its political system and to gain influence, uh, to gain access. Uh, so I take it real. I take it seriously, and I think we have to be again. We don't have to do what they're doing in order to compete with them. We have all sorts of, I think, structural advantages in the United States, but I think we need we need to make it more of a priority to compete with with uh, Belt and Road, and also put more pressure on China for those aspects of Belt and Road which are really uh, making situations worse for many countries, which is putting them in real uh, difficult loan repayment uh, situation. But I think again, yeah, we we have all sorts of assets in terms of technology, trade. Uh, exchange programs uh, and so forth. So I, what, but what we need is a comprehensive approach. In some cases, country by country. Some cases, globally, to compete with uh, with uh, Belt and Road. And Peace Corps, by the way, is a perfect example of one of the tools we have. This is a sensational uh, program, and that's one of the things we can uh, we can and should uh, deploy. Yeah, and just quickly jump in on this. Um, I just want, the one thing is always keep in mind when you talk about these gigantic Chinese projects is that uh, the Chinese government is not infallible. They make mistakes all the time and they could very well have overreached themselves and let the BRI gotten out of control. And they themselves could find themselves in deep trouble and giving out loans that they're not gonna get paid back on which will put them. So it's, you know, I think we, a little bit what the psychological warfare thing, sometimes we build up China as this incredibly effective government apparatus, which it is in some ways, but they're not infallible. They do make uh, mistakes. And I th think this could very well be one of them. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. We have, I, I think uh, America has just done a terrible job on crafting and uh, embracing and maintaining good policy in Africa uh, to our peril. Uh, I mean, I could tell you story after story of my, my trips there and African ambassadors here coming to us saying, you know, please, would you, would America get involved? So I think I would pick off one or two countries in Africa that we think we can make a big impact and show, right? We, sometimes we want to fix all of it all at the same time. Uh, and China just goes in candidly with suitcases full of cash uh, and gets their way. I mean, they underbid, they bribery is a part of their culture in uh, getting that business across Africa and the Middle East. And so we did, we can combat that, but I don't think we fix it all at once. I think we find a few places in Africa where we can go in, uh, train their their uh, law enforcement community, which is a big State Department project, re-engage XM Bank and its ability to, to uh, uh, provide funds for American businesses to operate there competitively. Uh, and by We're also... I don't know if we've lost Mike again for a second. Uh, can I say one thing to, to what well, I think we can, we can also do, and it's going to be available in the next six months or eight months, which is as vaccines get developed in the United States to deal with COVID-19, if we were to make them available, join these various international initiatives and make some of the vaccines available, in Africa and other parts of the world, I think that would do extraordinary good in terms of banking goodwill, in terms of helping these societies recover economically, helping the global public health challenge, because again, they will help them recover there. So we are going to have a massive opportunity in 2021 to use, I believe, uh, vaccine technology, take advantage of it. And if we share it and make it available on terms that people can afford, I think that is a made to order opportunity for the United States uh, and much of the world. And this has been such a great discussion. I, I hate to end it, but we're coming up on a hard stop in about a minute, um, but somehow it does seem appropriate to end the discussion, uh, a 2020 conference with a discussion about COVID-19. So. Uh, perhaps that is uh, the the ideal stopping point. Um, I do want to thank the panelists, gentlemen. It was it was a pleasure serving on this panel with you today. 
and certainly want to thank the audience uh, for joining us. And also um, a reminder, two things. One, the CLE password, again. And the next convention event is a discussion of agency leaders on labor policy, and it will begin at 1230. And thank you all again. Thanks, Judge.